Welcome to the Not Old Better Show. I'm host Paul Vogelsang, and this is episode number 187, part one of a two-part series. Our guest over the next two episodes is writer, historian, filmmaker, and genealogist Regina Mason. This will be a wonderful conversation, so thanks for joining us. Hi, everybody. Paul Vogelsang here. Welcome to the Not Old Better Show. Thanks for joining us today. Today's show is a great one. Again, our guest, Regina Mason, is a well-known international speaker, author, executive producer, and storyteller who believes in the extraordinary will of the human spirit. Regina Mason has spent 15 years researching the life and times of her great-great-great-grandfather, pioneering fugitive slave autobiographer, William Grimes. She has spent nearly a lifetime turning a negative into a positive that would one day culminate with a new edition of her ancestor's book, The Life of William Grimes, The Runaway Slave. As I delved into William Grimes' autobiography, the language astonished me. Yet up to that point, I had no idea that the author was my ancestor. He sums up his life story in the preface of his book with these words. Those who wish to know who Grimes is and what is his history, he would inform them that he is now living in Litchfield, Connecticut, that he is about 40 years of age, that he is married to a black woman and passes for a Negro, though three parts white, that he was born in a place in Virginia, had lived in several different states, and had been owned by ten different masters, that about ten years since he ran away and came to Connecticut where, after six years, he was recognized by some of his former master's friends, taken up and compelled to purchase his freedom with the sacrifice of all he had earned. William Grimes, Litchfield, October 1st, 1824. That, of course, is our guest today, Regina Mason, reading from her great-great-great-grandfather's book, The Life of William Grimes, The Runaway Slave. Regina Mason currently serves as executive producer of the film documentary Gina's Journey, The Search for William Grimes, and is joining us today via Skype from Oakland, California. Regina Mason, it is such a pleasure to speak with you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I, of course, met you at an event a couple of weeks ago, a genealogy-related event, and you were talking about your book, The Life of William Grimes, The Runaway Slave, which is, is just excellent. It's a story. It's a family history story, but there's genealogy certainly at its core. Where did your interest in genealogy come from, and and when was that? Well, let me just say this. The the seeds were planted way back in 1971 when I was a fifth grader at St. Augustine School in Oakland, when when a class assignment on ancestry and origins uh, made me go home and ask about my family history. So the interest was sparked there, Um, but it wouldn't be until 20 years later in 1970, excuse me, in 1991, when I decided to actually take up genealogy. By this time, I was a young wife and mother, and um, I had two little girls, and I wanted them to know their family history far better than I did. And I may, I should add that that class assignment was rather painful because it was the first time that I had to look at slavery in my family. It was no longer ab- abstract. It was then made personal, and it <laughs> actually hurt my feelings, you know, because I uh, had always heard about America being uh, being freedom loving America. I knew slavery existed in as part of the, the American narrative, but I didn't realize how close it was to me. Only a few generations removed. So that's when I uh, started to you know pay attention to what was going on in, in my world. 
uh, what was going on in the community in terms of race relations and what was going on on a national level. I mean, this is the era uh, on the heels of the Civil Rights Movement that morphed into uh, black nationalism and, and, and so forth. And again, I, I, I grew up in Oakland, California. I saw the Black Panthers. They were omnipresent in my community, and they were very much enraged, um, very much um, interested in equality by any means necessary. And so sometimes it played out on the nightly news in a rather um, militant fashion that just made me take notice. And I wondered why there was such a rage in my community. And part of that was confronted in a simple class assignment. Fascinating. It really is just this wonderful story and journey. So tell us a little bit about that journey. What what was it like? Were you just, the moment you were, you were captivated by this, were you just in libraries and archives and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Yes. Uh, you know, one thing about genealogy, once you get going, you can't stop. <laughs> I don't care what your background is. It's just so fascinating, very fascinating. And and to discover records that sort of validate your family story is huge. It, it makes you feel part of the American makeup. It makes you feel connected to history for the first time. Because, you know, as a kid, learning about American history, I um, n- never saw myself in it never saw myself in it, but once you begin gene- genealogy, you do. You discover um, your ancestors were very much part of the American narrative. But for me, uh, delving into genealogy meant trying to authenticate the family lore. And that stemmed from uh, my Aunt Catherine, who's the family historian. She gave me One little sentence that stayed with me for years, and again, this was during that fifth grade class assignment, and she told me that we had a male ancestor from New Haven, Connecticut, with the Grimes surname, who had some connection to the Underground Railroad. That was huge in my fifth grade mind, because I was just learning about the Underground Railroad and American slavery and, you know, just American history. And when she gave me that little thread of a story, I I wanted to know more information about this Grimes person because evidently he had resisted slavery, and that's what I wanted to hear. But again, all she knew were those three little clues. So I never forgot them. And off and on, I would remind Aunt Catherine of that little thread of a story, and still, you know, she could never give me any more. So 1991, again, I'm a young wife and mother, and I decided that I wanted to see if there was any measure of truth in the story that she told. So after I had started acquiring documentation, like vital statistics and uh, you know, birth and death records and uh, the census um, data that would show, you know, my family living in a particular household and family members listed, I realized that records were out there. And so I thought about Grimes, and I said, well, maybe I could find him. Maybe someone has written about him, you know. So that was my mentality, and I started pairing the methodology of genealogy with books on the Underground Railroad, the abolitionist movement, American history in general. I just read everything I could find, looking, hoping to find this Grimes person. And one day I had library books that were due, 
And there was a title that I hadn't read, and it was Charles L. Blossom's book, The Underground Railroad. So I immediately turned to the Free New England chapter, and within the first few paragraphs, I read a passage that made my heart drop. Bloxon essentially said that a gentleman from Savannah, Georgia, named William Grimes, escaped that southern city on a brig where he was hid or concealed under bales of cotton, and that this ship, eventually sailed to New York City, where Grimes was let off. Or he, he well, actually, he was um, spotted on board, and uh, some of the sailors helped him get off the ship unnoticed. And that he, while in New York, he was directed on foot to... New Haven, Connecticut, by Underground Railroad workers. Well, that just blew me away. In those two paragraphs, everything that Aunt Catherine had given me was revealed. Uh, The Grimes surname, now I had a first name, William Grimes. The fact that that he was from, um, that he settled in New Haven, Connecticut, and the fact that I was reading an Underground Railroad book, I, I couldn't ignore those signs. So where did Bloxon get his big, big uh, excuse me, where did Bloxon get his information? Mm-hmm. Well, his bibliography revealed that this William Grimes person had written his life story and published it himself. <laughs> so I had to find this book. Right. I had to have it. I, I, I just needed to know, was this an ancestor? Well, it turns out that his book, Life of William Grimes, A Runaway Slave, Brought Down to the Present, was republished in an anthology in 1971 called Five Black Lives. And that anthology consisted of five slave narratives from the Connecticut area and included of course, was Grimes' story. And at that time, the book was still in print. And so I went down to Cody's bookstore after calling around, and they had three copies on their shelf. Wow. I had no idea that this man belonged to me, uh, but something deep down told me that he did, and I ended up buying all three books. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I wanted my Aunt Catherine to have one, I wanted my mother to have one, and I needed one for myself. And so I bought all three, not knowing that if he was part of our family or not. You you didn't really realize that William Grimes was related to you until you kind of uncovered an obituary. And, and that led you to some in further investigation within a family Bible, which is often a right. great place to look for some of these family stories. Absolutely. Well, there was always a myth in, myth in the family, or lore, that we had a family Bible, but my mother hadn't even seen it, and she was born in 1933, and Catherine was born in 1917, and so certainly a Catherine that was older than my mom and perhaps knew a lot more about the family history than she did. But my mother had prepared me for disappointment. She said, you know, Gina, I always heard talk about this Bible, but I have never seen it. And I started asking around uh, to some of the seniors in the family if they had seen the family Bible. And everyone said the same thing my mom said. We always heard about it, but we had never seen it. So... um, I, my thing was, well, you know, let me put this out of my head, and Catherine didn't precisely know where this Bible was. She told me when the weather got better, she would go up to Portland to see if it was in her sister's attic. Hmm. Well, I had all this information in front of me, and I needed answers now. <laughs> so I decided to look for William Grimes, the author, 
to see whether names in his family would cross-reference with the names in my family. Mm. And so I, I began the paper trail to the the author. And I found him in the censuses. I found him from night from excuse me 18 20 all the way up to 1860 I found the author but not one name cross reference with the names in my um family tree and so I was sort of at a stalemate I was stuck with trying to make that connection. But in the meantime, I was finding out all this information about William Grimes, the author, and I was completely sucked into this narrative, whether he was my ancestor or not. And I began uncovering all the the, the holes in his book and and the people that he identified and even those that he spoke of but didn't say their names, like his father, I eventually found out that his father um, was a wealthy white planter by the name of Benjamin Grimes. And the way I pieced that together was William Grimes talks about a murder that takes place on his father's plantation and that he, he kills a man for nothing more than trespassing on his property. And I thought, okay, well, somebody had to write about that, you know, my late 20. 20th century thinking cap was on, and I thought, okay, maybe I can find this murder, and if I could find it in newspapers, then that would confirm William Grimes' story, and and that's exactly how it happened. I uh, found the actual murder in in a Virginia newspaper dating back to August 7th, 1794, and so then I, I, so I started taking this narrative to an exciting new level, something that no historian or scholar had ever attempted to do, and I was doing this still not knowing if William Rons was my ancestor. So lo and behold, when I could not make any sort of headway into the, into William Grimes's genealogy, and my mother phoned to announce that Aunt Catherine was on her way home with pages she had found tucked inside the family Bible. Hmm. And I just, <laughs> it just blew my mind because I actually had forgotten about that Bible. And because Aunt Catherine, it was a year later, and Aunt, Aunt Catherine didn't tell me she was going up to Portland, but she evidently had a conversation with my mom. So the timing could not have been better, because Aunt Catherine did eventually come home with these Bible pages, and let me tell you, I was so emotional, so emotional to see these frail pages, aged, blotted, and stained, and some of the corners that had crumbled to dust. It was just absolutely amazing. (laughs) For the first time in my life, I felt like I had roots, Mm -hmm. anchored roots, roots that went way back to the 1700s. And there were names that um, the whoever the historian, family historian or member that recorded this data even had names that she could not even identify because they were so old. She had names, but she had no dates. And I say she, I feel like the recorder of the Bible pages was William Grimes' youngest daughter, my great-great-grandmother, Cecilia Victoria. It could have been her or it could have been William Grimes' wife, Clarissa. I don't know, but I will try to see if I could determine whose handwriting that is, because I do have Clarissa's handwriting that I found, and so I'm going to see if I could get with an expert to to determine whether it's the same writing in the Bible. So Uh, Anyway... Yeah, so I I was just going to jump in. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I I can just hear 
this in your voice about the just the the success of, of, of finding this. And I'm curious, from grade school to Aunt Catherine's locating the Bible pages, how long did all that take you? Oh, gosh, that's at least 23 years mm-hmm. later. Mm-hmm. So a long. 25 years later, after I had first heard about William Grimes, I was finally able to to prove his connection to me. Because in the Bible page, there is a recorded death date of August 21st, 1865. And those were the same dates that uh, newspapers had written about William Grimes, the autobiographer. Mm-hmm. So I knew without a shadow of a doubt that this man recorded in our family Bible was the author of the first fugitive slave narrative in American history. And that first fugitive slave narrative was published in 1825, is that right? That is correct. Shortly after his master finds him and demands that he give up his home uh, as payment for, I call it false freedom, because freedom was never really freedom for any person of color in the so-called free North. And this was in New Haven, Connecticut, when his master finds him? Yes. After after the escape, okay. Nine years after he had escaped from Savannah, Georgia, and living as a fugitive in the so-called free state of Connecticut. And so, specifically, what what is the story of William Grimes? You know, you talk about the escape, and you, of course, have mentioned his his father. Did you ever learn anything about his mother? What what else did you learn in as you were kind of going through the book, the the runaway slave? Yeah. The, oh, so much. First of all. I did not, I was not able to learn really anything about his mother. He conceals her identity in the book as well, very much like he does his father. But he, again, I was able to identify his father based on a murder. Uh, his mother um, is still unknown to me, but I have very good clues. And especially now in this digital age, uh, it will be, I believe, a lot easier to find her. There are clues screaming at me that um, couldn't really uh, lead to who she is. And I think I know who she is. I just haven't found that corroborating piece of information. But to go back to your point, what did I learn? I learned (laughs) so much about the slave system, Mm -hmm. the slave culture. This man's story uh, the brutality that it was, the the unfathomable world that people today could hardly comprehend. It is not sugar coated. It is it's it is the most difficult reading about slavery I had ever done in my life. And I eventually had to partner with an expert on the slave narrative and early African American autobiography to help me make sense of this book. And the partnership was with William L. Andrews, who wrote an incredible book called To Tell a Free Story, based on early African-American autobiography. And in his book, he talks about William Grimes. And he was the only living scholar that I could confer with about William Grimes. And after two or three years sharing information back and forth with Dr. Andrews, he approached me and he said, you know, we should team up. You've uncovered a wealth of information about William Grimes. And he said, I could help you put this into 
historical and literary perspective. So that was a great education for me because while I was uncovering this information, I would not have been able to um, to deliver the uh, the how what can I say? I would not have been able to put this into historical and literary perspective on my own. I needed Bill's help. So it turned out to be a great partnership. And I learned from Bill that William Grimes' narrative is precedent-setting. Uh, one fact that really just blew me away was that William Grimes is the first autobiographer to write about slavery in the South. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So white people got to see and read the words about Southern slavery from someone who lived it. Mm -hmm. That just blew me away. I could not have put that into perspective without Bill. William Grimes was the first autobiographer fugitive slave autobiographer to write on the cover of his book written by himself. Now imagine that in 1825 when African Americans were still considered three-fifths of a person, when they were not citizens. Uh, this man boldly stated that he wrote this book by himself, that he did not need any help from any white person or sponsor, that he did it alone. That was huge in my mind, and very radical, if not revolutionary, because reading and writing was a sacred privilege mm -hmm. for white people, and affluent white people. There were poor white people that couldn't read or write. He doesn't specifically say how he learned how to read and write, but he does leave the clues. Mm. William had a strong sense of who he was, and he attributed that to his father being a very fearless man and so forth. Uh, he speaks fondly about his father, and yet it's bittersweet. He always thought that his father would purchase him. His father didn't own him. William Grimes was owned by Dr. Stewart on a neighboring plantation because William's mother was owned by Dr. Stewart. And the culture was that the children followed the condition of their mother. So although William Grimes' father was a wealthy white planter, he didn't own his son. Dr. Stewart did because his mother was the property of Dr. Stewart. So it goes to show you how complex slave culture was. Mm -hmm. So getting back to reading and writing, uh, William Grimes always said that he was a fast learner mm -hmm. and that if he, he had been given the chance, he would have done so much more with his life. But he leaves clues in his book. He talks about being a teenager on a Thornton plantation. Dr. Uh, Colonel Thornton puts a stove in the slave quarter for the slaves, and the mortar is still green, but yet William Grimes is writing words and symbols and letters on this this mortar, and he gets a severe beating for it. He talks about another time in Savannah that he was accused of writing an unflattering note about a, a doctor, and he swore up and down that he didn't do it, but what surprised me was that everybody around him knew he was capable of doing it. So he leaves us clues, but his book wasn't written for the purpose of telling everyone how he learned to read and write. Dr. Andrews likes to say that the Grimes narrative reads like, like a list of grievances against the United States. You see, William wrote his story on the heels of his master finding him, so he had to give up the deed to his home, the roof over his children's heads. And uh, so he, the only thing he had left was his story. And so he decided to write his story, to tell what happened to him. That concludes part one in our two-part series with Regina Mason. In part two, available now, 
you'll hear more from Regina Mason about the fascinating story of her great-great-great-grandfather, William Grimes. Join us for part two when Regina Mason talks about family search, history, the discovery of the first picture of William Grimes, and the new film, Gina's Journey. Please check it out.